Hello, welcome to Book Passages virtual event this evening. My name is Allison Bainbridge. I'm so honored to introduce our guest speakers today, Andrew Meyer and Liesl Schillinger. They're going to be discussing Andrew's latest work, Morgenthau Power, Privilege and the Rise of the American Dynasty. Uh, this book is an epic and intimate portrait of four generations of Morgenthau family, a dynasty of power brokers and public officials with an outsized uh, and previously unmapped influence extending from daily life in New York City to the shaping of the American century. In the words of former mayor Ed Coach, they were the closest we've got to royalty in New York City. What I find so fascinating lately is that many of the books that are considered in the history genre are really allowing us to gain a perspective on what's going on presently. And I think this book um, definitely gives us that um, effect. Uh, the Kennedys and Bushes haven't just reached great heights, they stood for something, or at least they've created the expectation that they do. In Morgenthau, Andrew Meyer makes a 1,046 page case for a different kind of dynasty. Um, one where the protagonists have uh, little in common except their inherited privilege. Andrew's gracefully written account doesn't neatly cohere along a single theme, but that may just reflect the messy realities of family life. As we all know, all happy families may be alike, but it appears that the Mar Morgenthaus were dynastic in their own way. Um, the saga of Morgenthaus is laying half hidden in the shadows for too long. Morgenthau, though at heart, is a family history. It is also an American epic, as sprawling and surprising as the country itself. Um, Andrew Meyer is the award-winning journalist and author of Black Earth, A Journey Through Russia After the Fall and Lost Spy in American and Stalin Secret Service. A former Moscow correspondent of time, he has contributed to the New York Times Magazine, among numerous other publications, for more than two decades. His work has been recognized with fellowships from multiple prestigious organizations, and he lives in Brooklyn with his wife and their two daughters. Um, we're so pleased also to introduce as Andrew's conversation partner for today's discussion, Liesl Schillinger. Liesl is a New York-based critic, translator, and educator. She worked at The New Yorker for more than a decade and became a regular critic for um, the New York Times Book Review in 2004. Her articles and essays have appeared in numerous publications, including The New Yorker, The New York Times, Washington Post, and many more. Her recent translations have included the novels Every Day, Every Hour by Natasha Drodnik, The Lady of the Camellias by Alexandra Dumas, and Free Day by Inez Cagnati. I don't know if I said that one right. Um, if you'd like to pose a question, viewers, you can do so in uh, your chat. Just type it in. and um, Or if you just like to make a comment, they'll be seeing that as well. So I just, at this point, like to offer a very warm welcome to both of you, Andrew and Liesl. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. And um, I guess I'll kind of plunge in. And uh, I want to tell you, first of all, Andrew, that I have really been doing a deep dive into this book, and I've had so much fun. I wasn't expecting this, because I know the name Morgenthau. As a New Yorker, you know he was a mocker, you know he was influential, you know he was the DA, but I didn't know about his forebears, who were so shockingly influential the one with Woodrow Wilson, uh, that's his his grandfather, Henry, and then his father, also Henry. I think you said we should call the grandfather the ambassador. He was ambassador to Turkey, right as World War I built up. And uh, then his father, who was a, a, a farmer, sort of, in, uh, in Dutchess County, had a beautiful farm that he loved, ended up being a secretary of the treasury for FDR and a close personal friend. But so, when you go to these three men, and I haven't even mentioned their amazing grandfather, their amazing forebear, Lazarus, who came over from Germany. Andrew will tell you about that. Um, but I just wanted to say, it'd be one thing to write a biography of one Zelig, but you've got three Zeligs here who span 150 yeah. years. 
you know, I uh, think that, uh, yeah, thank you, Lizo. I think that's, <laughs> that's a long way of saying, a good way of saying it was a crazy book. Um, this book, uh, as you know, was more than a, a decade in the making, and it is more than 150 years of U.S. and world history. It's four generations in one family, um, and uh, colleagues of mine have said, you know, you must have been crazy to take this on. Um, so it's great to hear that you actually having fun reading it. And I do tell people it's a thousand pages, but you can almost dip in anywhere along the way, and hopefully, um, you'll find delight in and you uh, and you'll get a sense of what this family is uh, if you even look at a slice. They're very short chapters. It's a long book, but they're short chapters. Right. And as Allison was saying, you know, not only is it uh, a, a story about the family, each, each, the constellation of each generation of Morgenthau's and how they related to each other, but uh, their involvement in world politics and the shaping of New York and world policy was just astonishing. Um, I know that we're going to go, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions, but I think we were going to start by showing a short little film to let the people have a picture uh, uh, in their minds of the multiple generations of this family. And I will tell you in the short video, which is like 30 seconds, you're going to see some people I, th I think you'll recognize, some world leaders, but you'll also see two Morgenthaus, uh, uh, Henry Jr., who worked for FDR, and his son, Robert. Uh, but uh, I, I, I think the father is also present, but Andrew will tell you about this. So here's just a little taste of the Morgenthaus, and then we'll go through a bunch of them. Before we uh, go into the pictures, I just wondered if you could sort of, there were some captions in, in that little video. Can you tell them what the farm was? Uh, so it he was taken to yeah, the so that, that's, that video. That's obviously um, Eleanor Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, um, President Franklin Roosevelt, and Winston Churchill uh, in a manner that people at the time rarely, if ever, saw. It's at the Morgenthau Farm, which is in Dutchess County, about an hour north of where we are in New York City. And the man in his dressed whites there is the future DA, Robert Morgenthau, wiping his hand after having eaten the last of the shrimp once the president and the first lady and the prime minister have left. It's June 1942, and it may look lighthearted. Actually, uh, the young um, uh, naval officer, Robert Morgenthau, had just served mint juleps uh to the it was fdr's favorite drink mint juleps and you see the cocktails there and he offered it to churchill and churchill took one sniff of it and said now give me something stronger and then he got uh whiskey um it was a story that the da told for years um to reporters and it was only when his sister who was eminent in her own right dr joan morgenthal she was a pediatrician and much more she founded one of the first adolescent youth uh, health centers in the United States. Uh, Joan Morgenthau was moving out of her home in Connecticut, and she's found a lot. The, the, the generation after generation of Morgenthau's kept almost everything. And Joan was actually throwing things out. And she found, uh, it was rescued literally from the trash can, these old home videos that her father used to keep. Uh, he, he himself, when he was Secretary of the Treasury, would uh, take out his old, I think it was a Super 8, um, or it was a 16 millimeter, I don't know, and would make his home movie. He did this in Washington um, when the royal visit uh, happened in 1938. Also, uh, Dr. Joan Morgenthau found he did this in Normandy um, when Normandy was in ruins and he went at the height of the war. 
So uh, these are documents that are now at the U.S. Um, uh, Holocaust Museum in Washington, part of uh, the Morgenthau collection there. That, that, that's just astonishing. Um, but th I, I can't believe you found that. And here you see the man's influence, you know, and, uh, you know, it, it, many people thought of him as a very uh, shy man. I think you said that uh, you write rather that uh, when Truman came to be president after after Roosevelt suddenly died, um, uh, Hen Henry Jr. quit being secretary of the treasurer and uh, Truman said he was a blockhead and a nut or something. Um, but it's clear that he had a, a really warm relationship with FDR and that's a really big part of the book. Could you just tell us a little bit about his relationship with FDR before I backtrack to the his 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 answer? Yeah, we're going to hodgepodge around here because as you say it is it is 50, 150 years and it is there are two Henrys, Henry Sr. and Henry Jr., four generations. But really at the heart of the book is exactly what you just said. There was this unique and little understood relationship. You know, hundreds of books have been written, if not thousands, on FDR. Uh, half of them are on my shelf in the back. <laughs> and Morgenthau is in all of them. And he's usually a caricature. Uh, he's misunderstood. He's often abused. He was contemporaneously misunderstood and abused. And history has not been kind to him. And one of the things I really do like about that home uh, movie is that it shows a different side of Henry. It shows him as a, a jovial, intimate, warm, funny, joking around. And these are the qualities that FDR actually loved. He liked other things about him too. He was compliant to the point of almost being his vassal. He was in fear of uh, FDR. FDR was not just his best friend. He was the sun god. I mean, FDR, he lived and breathed uh, for the president. They had known each other um, as early as 1914. So long before um, Roosevelt runs for president, when FDR um, contracted polio, Henry was one of the few people he allowed to physically car carry him up the stairs at the farm. There were two or three stairs into the house. Um, they had this intimacy. They joked together. They jostled together. They exchanged chits throughout the 12 years they were together in, the Was in Washington. They would make little remarks about other people during cabinet. But most importantly, Henry became what Eleanor Roosevelt mm -hmm. said, you are the conscience of the president. You are Franklin's conscience. And I think actually she, of course, in, in typical fashion was underselling herself. She was FDR's conscience. Um, the most interesting political marriage, I think, in world history. Uh, but that sh the, the, video, the, the, the film shows that kind of intimacy. But just the people watching the film might assume that it's at Hyde Park at FDR and, and, and Eleanor's country place, which is like half an hour away from uh, Henry Morgenthau's country place. So they were friends. I, I was moved by your book, by the examples of, of uh, FDR and Eleanor coming over for dinner and FDR saying, you know, kill 16 chickens or something. Someone says coming and he's hungry. I mean, they were true friends. This wasn't acquaintances or people who were useful to each other. This was real. So let me let me dive back into the four pictures so you can maybe tell us a bit about where Henry stands in the dynasty. Great. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So we begin here at the left. Can you tell us about Lazarus and how he brought the clan over? So this is Lazarus uh, on the left holding He's, he's dressed in his Prince Albert frock, which was his uh, signature outfit, and his white bow tie. Um, and that large um, em, uh, embossed book he's holding, you can barely make it out there. It was the Golden Book of Life. That was his patented invention um, for philanthropy, particularly for Jewish institutions. He came um, from southern Germany, the northern part of Bavaria. He was born into a very large and poor religious family. They were, of course, Jews. He found his own way, though. He was orphaned as a teenager. Uh, there were uh, many, many brothers. And he soon left, um, he left uh, the strictures of orthodoxy. He became one of the reasons why he always was wearing that bow tie is because he actually made ties. And then he becomes uh, a, a cigar baron, um, first in the south of Germany and then in Mannheim. Uh, at his height, 
he had at least four factories making cigars and a thousand people rolling them. Where were all these cigars going? Bizarrely enough, they were going to where uh, many of our audience are in Northern California. Uh, they were selling German grown cigars to uh, the 49ers during the gold rush. Things were going great. He had uh, a small fortune. He was received by the Grand Duke of Baden. He was named a free man, which was a rarity and an honor uh, for a Jew in Germany. And then Lincoln's uh, Civil War tariffs hit. And during the war, um, Lazarus lost everything. He comes to America with his children in 1866. He still has these illusions of grandeur. He thinks that he's going to be um, the same baron that he was uh, in Germany and New York, and nothing ever comes right for him. Uh, the golden book of life that he's posing with there was just one of many um, inventions that he he patented and tried. He you ends know, up, sorry, I, I yeah, wanted... he just a long story short, he ends up alone, impoverished, um, and uh, destitute in a rented room in, in, uh, on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Right, but I, I I know we can't say everything that's in your pages, but your stories are so fun and rich. I mean, he's almost like a, a tragic character from a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta. You know, he, he tries to make uh, cigarettes out of pine needles and nostrums. He's always having these, pursuing these get rich quick schemes. You know, that book you were telling people had to pay a thousand dollars, which is a lot in 1870 or whatever, to inscribe their names in it. And so it, it's not, he's always, he carries very much about his, his, uh, I don't know, his, 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 his idealistic hopes and so forth. And I was really interested in the book, uh, in how his son, uh, this one, who you'll tell us about next, uh, ended up really just trying to preserve his family from his father's increasing eccentricity, even to the point of getting him barred from his own wedding when he married very well. So let's hear about that's how exactly Henry. sorry that yeah that's Henry uh, who of uh, not only were these powerful men um, with their own idiosyncrasies they were also powerful and extremely intelligent and long suffering women alongside them so Lazarus uh, wife Babette uh, gave birth to fourteen women over twenty three years it's quite an endurance run 14, 14 children, children over two, 14 children over 23 years. All right. Henry is the ninth. Um, and by others were quite successful. Uh, there's actually a Morgan Club um, branch in San Francisco. Um, but Henry is the self-made man. He's very fearful of Lazarus, as you put it uh, so well, his growing eccentricities. He writes, Papa, uh, if you keep this up, the police are going to come and shame is going to befall our family and I will have nothing to do with you anymore. He hires the Pinkerton, those Pinkerton agents to keep him at bay physically during his wedding day. He and his siblings conspire to send Babette, who's at physical danger. Uh, they send her to Chicago during this whole period. And out of the ruins of the father, the patriarch, uh, Henry goes to Columbia Law School. He's forced to leave college. He goes to Columbia. He graduates very young. He starts a three-man law firm downtown Manhattan. He does. Uh, he begins very slowly, and then he turns quickly to real estate, uh, which at the time was absolutely overlooked uh, for the for, for, as a uh, financial field. It was Wall Street or nothing. And Manhattan, of course, is growing. It's the period of um, on the on the, the not only the Gilded Age, but it's the beginning of consolidation, the consolidation movement with what we now know as Brooklyn, um, was the fourth largest city in the country. New York City becomes consolidated, and Henry Morgenthau is absolutely central to this. Others have written about other characters. Uh, he was the first to take on the Astors. The Astors own land and own property, but they never sold it. He was the first to buy from the Astors. He followed the subway lines, which were then, of course, growing all the way up to Northern Manhattan. He developed most of, much of Northern Manhattan, the Bronx, Harlem, uh, and becomes a multimillionaire I just along the way. Because yeah. Because what you were saying, we see in our modern, we're, we're so used to the idea, oh yeah, he got that land and that, he developed that. It wasn't something people were doing. 
like this this story uh, 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 sort of evolves as you were telling me about real estate the idea that real estate was a going concern for a man of a certain position was something that he kind of am i right that he did a lot to originate that Absolutely. And not only that, the mechanics of it, which I, one of the reasons why this took so many years to write, I got fascinated with each one. Not only each generation deserves its own uh, book, but the history of New York real estate. It's the making of New York from Dutch dairy farms uh, when they arrived in 1866 to suddenly the vertical city. It's the rise of the vertical city due to engineering, due to labor of course, immigrant labor, the swells and swells of immigrants coming in, but also vertical in the sense that Manhattan was going north, 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 north. And he saw that. He had an incredible vision. It wasn't just the, the motive for profit and greed. Later, he writes about this and he tells his son, the next guy <laughs> glowering at us in the screen, he tells Henry Jr., too long I worshipped at the wrong altar, the almighty dollar. Now, it was easy to say in his 50s when he was already a multimillionaire. Uh, after the Depression. But at the same time, he falls in love, not just with society, which he did. He helped save the Metropolitan Opera House. He tried to join Mrs. Astor's 100. The, the Jews, the Hebrews, as they were then called, had their own social register. There's all these um, sub-themes. He's trying to join society, but he really is trying to better his community. It sounds corny. It was the, it was the progressive movement. In 1910, 1911, 1912, a lot of this is people are rediscovering now. Uh, the idea that why are so many people living in tenements? Why are there no fair labor laws? Why is there no, dare I say, regulation? Henry Morgenthau was on the sanitary um, uh, committee. He was on the health committee after the, the infamous Triangle Shirtwaist fire. He became a political force. He had money but he tried to make it better for his community. And, uh, and, and also he turned away from traditional journalism, uh, journalism, traditional uh, Judaism, much like his, his father Lazarus. It's actually one of the things they have strongly in common is this kind of devout uh, ecumenical, I wouldn't say secular. Uh, he believed in the higher plane as he called it, but with the great rabbi, reform rabbi, Stephen Weiss, he founded the Free Synagogue, which uh, I know you'll appreciate. He called it, it should be pewless and dewless. And they met in a, ho the first meeting was in a hotel so that you would free yourselves of the strictures of the synagogue. You know, and then of course that plays out later also when Wise changes and there, he gets more involved in politics. Th these stories, every one of them, uh, drama, sometimes even melodrama. Uh, and... Um, you oh, know, yeah, they, they they fought each other. They were best friends. And then he writes a public letter that um, Israel. Mm -hmm. Zionism, Zionism is a stupendous fallacy, which uh, every anti-Zionist in the world still, still mm -hmm. likes to quote. Uh, okay. Henry Morgan thought did. Mm -hmm. And he broke uh, with Stephen Wise, mm -hmm. uh, who then, of course, to get to Junior very quickly, when he... Um, with his ally, uh, and the sun god, FDR, names him Im absolutely improbably the Secretary of the Treasury. He is still, to date, one of the longest-serving cabinet members in U.S. history. Twelve years he was by Roosevelt's side. Actually, earlier, throughout Albany, uh, when, when Roosevelt was two-term governor of New York. Henry Morgenthau, uh, his crowning achievement, uh, as many of our audience knows, was goading Roosevelt to save the remaining Jews. Uh, during World War II. It was too little too late um, by his own admission. He himself was goaded by his young staff of New Deal um, ideologues, all lawyers, none of whom were Jewish, to cry foul and to cry uh, in his famous words, um, the, the acquiescence um, of this government in the murder of the Jews. That was too much for Henry to take. He changed the title to report to the president. And the last mm -hmm. thing he wanted to do was to offend his best friend. Um, I don't and then, I don't, I yeah, his son, quite away I from him. very quickly. Okay. The guy on the right is uh, uh, the gentleman I got to know very well over 10 years, Robert M. Morgenthau, who was the DA uh, of Manhattan, as, as folks who served under him like to say, for life. He was 35 years officially in office. So those are the four generations. Okay. I guess, well, I'll, I'll douse the screen then, but I, I, I'm i just, one other thing, you had briefly mentioned the word journalism by mistake. 
it, I think people ought to know about uh, Henry Morgenthau Sr.'s connection with the New York Times because that was such a wonderful area in your book. Could you talk about basically his uh, how Henry made helped uh, the uh, Adolf Ox come to be at the Times? So Adolf Ox uh, had, he actually, like most of the German Jews, the R crowd families of New York, they actually came to America a decade or even two or three decades earlier. The Strausses, the Seligman, uh, um, they came earlier and Adolf Ox was one of them. He comes from Alabama and he comes to New York City and he knows very few people here. And he's tried before to buy a little paper that was... Uh, uh, not doing so well. Subscriptions uh, were floundering. Uh, it was barely standing, and he had a ripe opportunity. It was laden with debt. And uh, Henry Morgenthau helps his newfound friend, Adolf Hox, uh, first to purchase it, bundling together um, investors, but then to save the Times building, which was then downtown in Lower Manhattan on Park Row. There was Newspaper Row. There were dozens of newspapers uh, side by side there. They become best friends, uh, and it's completely transactional. They were like-minded. They were quite close. They actually traveled together. They went up and down California on various campaigns. They went through the South. Um, but early on, they said, no money shall, tra shall uh, pass between us. And allegedly, as best as I could pick up, uh, that they stayed true to that, even though Henry Morgenthau, um, which I describe in the book, is instrumental in taking Long Acre, what was formerly known as Long Acre Square, in the middle of Manhattan, then really actually northern, more northern Manhattan, and cobbling together the real estate. It's an intricate, very complex uh, story of New York real estate. They always are. Looking at the deeds, and there was a famous florist who wouldn't sell, and he held out. So actually, uh, what becomes Times Square and the Times Building is built on is almost triangular. It's trapezoidal, I think. It's now, mm -hmm. I think it was uh, a Navy recruitment site. It's still there. The, the the Times building is gone. That's what was there. Oh, my God. That's what was there because the subway, as you know, would run right up it. And the subway, the building was built directly on top of the subway so that when you ran the paper, the printing presses, the bundles would fall down and you'd have the fastest delivery system in the world. It so, wasn't all Henry Morgenthau's idea, but he was the one who cobbled um, the real estate together. Through his hands went through much of the landmarks of New York, uh, the New York Stock Exchange building itself, the plaza, uh, the old B. Altman building. He owned or, or, or put together a number of the great real estate deals uh, of the early part of the last century. And so, um, but so he is such a huge figure, must have been hard for Henry, the long awaited son. And there were three daughters and finally Henry Jr. Jr. I don't know if he was the fourth, but Henry was the one, the son really mattered. Could you talk a bit about uh, the father son relationship and how it changed as Henry came into his own Henry Jr.? Well, the women, I do want to point out, though, as I said, each generation, there are strong, intelligent, artistic, uh, rather brilliant women. and. Henry's three sisters also get short shrift. Um, they went on to illustrious careers in their own. And Barbara Tuckman, the famous historian, was the <clears throat> daughter of one of Henry's sisters. Um, oh, exactly. Fine. So uh, and there's tremendous tension between the favored son uh, and his sisters. And um, mm -hmm. yes, and, and rightly so, because their father openly said, Henry Sr. said uh, to his wife, Josie, you take the girls, I'll take the boy. And this, of course, was the worst thing that could possibly have happened for Henry Jr. He's under the influence, he's under the cudgel his entire life. He probably was severely dyslexic. Um, his own son uh, and daughter, uh, I mentioned Dr. Joan Morgenthau, believed that he was un completely undiagnosed um, at the turn of the century. He goes to Exeter, is miserable. There are these heart-wrenching le letters home. You know, I miss you. I love you. Can't you come get me? I have he then never goes seen to... more affectionate letters from a son to a father. Continuing yeah, they're, for decades. They're uh, quite something. And then in reverse, okay. and then in reverse, the, the senior is writing back saying, yeah, I hear you, but what about your grades? You know, and I hear you, but what about this? And he's constantly... Um, uh, badgering him, goading him with love and affection, but uh, he's he's building. He is actually already 
um, created a company, Henry Morgenthau and Son, and Junior wants nothing of it. So what happens, long story short, 1913, as you said at the outset, um, Papa buys um, Junior a, a little farm in Dutchess County. Um, and again, I went through the deeds and I figured out how, to the best I could, how much it costs, because later this all becomes mythologized. He and FDR were actually not contiguous uh, neighbors. Uh, Time Magazine and Fortune, when they wrote about uh, Morgenthau, when he becomes Secretary of the Treasury, and there's cover stories. They say that they would lean across the fence. But as you noted, it was actually a 20, 25 minute drive on those windy country roads that FDR loved to drive himself on, um, that they became good friends. And in part, they used to joke because they were the only two Democrats in Dutchess County. Dutchess County was, uh, was first of all, was Knickerbocker. Uh, there weren't many Jews. And second of all, it was um, it was Republican County. So as you also mentioned, um, FDR, it was sort of an escape for FDR, uh, the farm mm -hmm. um, coming from Hyde Park. Uh, Eleanor was famously a miserable cook. FDR loved to eat. And it was also a nice place where he could go and have a couple of cocktails with my friend Henry. He nicknamed him Henry the Morgue, and he loved to tease uh, Henry Jr., and, and clearly, Henry liked to be teased by him. One thing that comes up in the book, because you always you don't give the women short shrift, you give them a lot of attention. And uh, I was touched that uh, Henry Jr.'s wife, Eleanor, had a very close friendship with Eleanor Roosevelt and helped her. And she wrote and she worked on their campaigns. I mean, El Eleanor Morgenthau sounds so impressive. But also, there's a touching letter where uh, she could easily get jealous and think that Eleanor wasn't being kind enough to her. Um, it, it was touching to see how, how, how close, and they would advise, they would counsel each other on their jealousies. Uh, yeah, uh, it's an it's a very strong central relationship. Um, uh, they actually called it quadrilineal. The, the Morgenthaus and the Roosevelts, as I said, the Roosevelts had probably the most complicated uh, and perhaps effective political marriage in, in world history. <laughs> it's a tar it's a tough argument, but the Morgenthaus were the only couple that they would actually socialize with, and. I went to go see John Morton Blum, who's a famous historian at Yale, uh, who I think has taught more U.S. senators and presidents than any other man. And he had spent more than a decade with the Secretary of Treasury, uh, working on converting what were known as the Morgenthau Diaries, 900 volumes, which are up at the FDR library. John Morton Blum converted them into three, but working with um, Henry Jr. And he was the one who said, you know, I don't think he ever read a book cover to cover. I think he was dyslexic. He was, he had terrible eyesight, but he also had this dyslexia, again, undiagnosed. But John, uh, uh, Professor Blum was able to tell me, you can write something that I couldn't do. You can write the stories that he wouldn't let me put in um, about the sister, about the father, about the beginning of the farm. He didn't want anything anti-Semitic in there. Um, mm -hmm. And he also said, you know, he had a kind of brilliance which is little understood among historians and certainly in history, he could see far in the way that people who are very dyslexic can, you know, up close to problematic, but he could see far. And for the New Deal, it was a match made in heaven. He wasn't a New Dealer fiscally, but he, he had this kind of, he said, yeah, he was conservative fiscally. He didn't like the tax uh, increases at all. He spent more, his budgets were bigger than any uh, budget in US history. But Henry Morgenthau could see the far horizon, and especially when it comes to Germany and World War II, that is absolutely uh, extraordinary and important and central to the New Deal and to Roosevelt's legacy. Um, well, also, he didn't want power. He was a shy person, and he kept on trying to resist. And I think you say that FDR made him sort of the head of con conservation, but then gave him Hoover's failed Farm Bureau, and he turned it into something more profitable than the biggest banks. And then can you can you just talk a bit about what he how he changed his roles under under FDR? And so he our effort certainly. Yeah. So so uh, at a bit of a gallop in the in the in the nineteen twenties, he's farming. Henry Jr. is farming, and he actually loved nothing more than apple season in the fall and in the spring when it was the blossoms, and then the boughs were heavy with the apples. He actually d developed and learned all about different varieties working with the um, the pomologist at Cornell, uh, something that the DA then picked up for decades afterwards. He was very serious about his farming. 
He was a gentleman farmer, but he was quite serious about it. At one point, he also had a dairy um, uh, farm adjacent. And signs. yes, and as he's doing this, he takes on a local paper, uh, actually a big, um, I think it was the largest, the second largest agricultural paper in America, the American Agriculturalist. And again, he's quite serious about it. He wants to keep Papa at arm's length. I'm going to be the editor. He hires real um, uh, journalists and editors. He doesn't want to politicize. Papa wants to write about all of everything he did in it, in Armenia, to helping to save the Armenians, working with Near East Relief, which is rightly so. And he becomes um, kind of America's ambassador um, with a moral authority. But Henry doesn't want him using his little agricultural paper as, his tri as Papa's Tribune, his soapbox. But it does catch the eye of Franklin Roosevelt. And as I said, they are in the Democratic minority upstate. And through that paper, he does something which is rather extraordinary and underappreciated. He managed to convert upstate, which was Republican farmers, dairy farmers, long before the Depression, not in the best of, in the best of ways. He brings them, when Roosevelt becomes uh, governor, hard roads. And for the longest time, I was trying to figure out, what's the big deal about hard roads? Well, that's because I'm not a dairy farmer um, in the 1920s. Hard roads and electrification are what Roosevelt did as governor. They also built the parkways, a lot of the things that presaged the great work, uh, public works campaign, campaigns of the WPA and the New Deal. Mm -hmm. Henry Morgenthau did with Roosevelt in the 1920s in New York State. And they talk about this in the 30s. Let's remember, let's, let's do what we did in Albany. And it was a shorthand for them. Let's just try to, as we would now say, scale it up. Well, they scaled it up big to the entire country. Okay, and 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 so I, I want us to leave. I want to leave time for Bob, but uh, but but so you know it, it, it's extraordinary how he 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 basically uh, jumps to the treasury and is tremendously effective. But um, while World War II is going on, he is the one who's mobilizing. He's he's helping fund the World Jewish Congress, but in a he, he's being he's 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 he, like you said he's he's sort of uh, he doesn't want to be too upfront or obvious about it. He had he saved two hundred thousand people. What were some of his acts that you think matter most in the Second World War, as far as bringing? Well, I think I think to uh, just to, just to sort of touch on very quickly what uh, is underappreciated. I think rearming, uh, first of all, arming yeah. France and England uh, in 1933. He and Roosevelt exchanged notes. It's in the diaries as well. Um, do you think there will be war? Henry says. To Franklin and Franklin says yes, most certainly there will be. 1933, again that sense of prescience. Uh, in part, it was his father's warnings about German Prussian militarism. In part, it was because Junior had been to Turkey. He had actually been in Gallipoli at the front lines. Mm -hmm. uh, this was not a this was not a front line warrior, uh, Henry Morgenthau Junior. But he against his father's wishes. Remember, take care. Give me the boy. Let me take care of the boy. Henry Jr. goes with the Germans um, to Gallipoli and looks at the front line. He remembers that forever. And in 1933, he says, do you think there will be war? Obviously, Hitler is coming to power at the exact same time FDR is. Most of the country is isolationist. Most of FDR's own cabinet is not looking to Europe. They're looking to the troubles at home, uh, which were you know, extraordinary and historic. It's a tie that binds Morgenthau and Roosevelt, and he gets him through ways that are largely, uh, let us say, radical, if not illegal, to go around the Neutrality Act. Uh, I won't get into the details here, but they're rather ingenious. Um, when at, at a time when America was not on a war footing, uh, and Europe was struggling to, they didn't have the money. That's why Churchill was there in 1942, uh, almost a decade later, saying he's looking at Morgan as money bags. Give me the money. Give me mm -hmm. Lend-Lease and then given me second lend lease. Um, and they had a cont very contemptuous relationship. Um, so rearming Europe and then getting the US early on, long before World War, long before Pearl Harbor, to convert Detroit and Los Angeles to, into a war uh, economy. It wasn't easy at all. Uh, and he would call people up every day, sometimes at six in the morning and saying, you know, the head of Chrysler, what are you doing on this? What are you doing on that? And the Henry Morgenthau phone calls were famous 
in Washington, usually beginning at six in the morning, but across the country. He had, as he later told um, his son, Henry the third wife, you should have known me when I was somebody uh, because he did have tremendous, as you said, tremendous power when he was secretary of the treasury. Incredible. Moving on to Bob, he had a different kind of idealism. And we're, you know, since we're closer to Bob's era, he only died two, two and a half years ago or three years ago. Um, we maybe heard his name more often. And um, his idealism in your book, I was struck by his uh, feminism involving rape cases. I was struck by his uh, attachment to rooting out white collar crime. Could you talk a little about his sen sense of mission and how he differed from his father and grandfather? It's or a great question. It's a great question. I mean, he's he was almost 10 years as the chief federal prosecutor uh, in the Southern District uh, in New York under uh, JFK, um, right? under JFK, whom he had known, of course, this is the privilege in the subtitle, he had known JFK sailing, as we all did, um, sailing off the coast of Hyannisport. He also saw him in Antibes in 1938 in the summer, as one did these days. The Kennedys, the Kennedys and the Morgenthaus, uh, not often, but over many, many decades, found themselves in proximity. And I don't think it was a coincidence. Uh, the old man, Joe Kennedy, uh, Joe Kennedy, always wanted Henry Morgenthau's seat at, at the Treasury, and they went at each other. Um, when Bob is U.S. attorney, he stakes out a very close friendship with Bobby Kennedy, who, of course, was the attorney general. And Bobby Bobby Kennedy is much maligned. Uh, he, you know, people say that uh, he, he was um, one of the youngest attorney generals ever, that he learned on the job, uh, and it was an expensive education. He came in wanting to fight the mafia. It wasn't just Jimmy Hoffa. It wasn't just Roy Cohn, which Morgenthau also tried uh, to do. Love that section. He, mm -hmm. he indicted Roy Cohn three times. There were four trials. Every time Roy Cohn walked. Um, but what they did do together was take on the mafia. And up until Dallas, Bobby was the lead um, warrior. He was uh, he was the commander of that war, and Morgenthau was his lead general. And many people actually I interviewed. Uh, both from uh, Bobby Kennedy's time as Attorney General and as Morgan Todd's time as the U.S. Attorney in New York, they both said, up until the assassination, everybody thought the word was, the perception was, is that Bobby was going to go on to another job after the re-election, and Morgan Todd would have been Attorney General. Of course, it didn't happen. Instead, um, after a period of time in the mid-70s, he runs for DA, and as I said, he was DA almost for life for 35 years. I think he was 55 years old when he became DA. That's, you know, most people are thinking about retiring at, at that time. Um, he uh, obviously is DA um, until uh, 89, 90 years old. So the most infamous case, of course, is the Central Park Jogger case. Um, but you mentioned a few others. We can talk about the Jogger case as well. I devote four chapters to it in the book. Um, he really... I didn't know this when I started reporting and researching, but I quickly learned he created uh, the defense bar for corporate white collar crime. Many of the men and women, there weren't many, but there were a few women um, prosecutors who worked for him, they went on to lead the defense bar. And one of them said to me, uh, you have to understand, we don't just owe Bob Morgenthau our expertise, we owe him our careers because there were there was no white collar uh, crime being prosecuted, not just in New York, but anywhere uh, in the country, even though the SEC, the Securities Act was from the 30s, it they hadn't been bringing cases until Morgenthau was the prosecutor. It was one of his main um, landmarks is one of his main prosecutorial uh, uh, passions was white collar crime offshore. But he also, as you said, cared deeply and this, this is something that's also misunderstood or little understood about bias crimes, uh, about child abuse, and about rape. He led a fight and late in violence. his career mm -hmm. um, to change the law in New York on the statute of limitations on rape, not for all rapes, but for um, the most heinous rapes. Uh, and so that if you could lift the statute of limitation or extend the statute of limitation, you could do something that he was extremely proud of. It was the first in the country he called them uh, John Doe indictments, where you would indict the perpetrator's DNA 
you didn't have the perpetrator, which extended the there. statute of limitation in dozens of cases. Of course, when the perpetrator then is found, you match the DNA and you got the guy. Uh, it was it was it was revolutionary. And you know, this is just a magisterial job. I I, I don't know. I, I bet did you are there like two thousand pages you had to throw away because you just couldn't fit everything in. You don't have to. We don't have to get into that. I have a friend who's a psychologist, legal, and uh, about mid midway. I won't say midstream. I was somewhere across the uh, the Atlantic. You know, writing any book uh, is <laughs> is a dangerous um, uh, passion mission. Uh, I won't say calling, but this was transatlantic sailing. And uh, when I was in the middle of the ocean, uh, I turned to a friend of mine who's a psychologist, and I said, you know. I'm known as being pretty thorough and kind of obsessive. I bet there's, I said, I bet there's a syndrome uh, named uh, for this. He said, oh, there's several. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, yeah, you're, you're suffering several. A good one. But so how did you get interested in telling this story? What led you to it? Because I have a feeling you're in the room as the book begins and maybe as it ends. You mentioned his five Rolodexes and everything. What what led you to tell this story? Um. Uh, it, yeah. It's very simple. I had, as Allison said in her great introduction, I had, and the last book I wrote was about um, an American, um, also an immigrant, but a very different kind of immigrant, Isaiah Syogans, who um, was an idealist, uh, becomes a common turn agent and a Soviet agent. And he graduated Columbia College. Uh, he was self-made, um, much um, uh, coming of age at the time that... Um, uh, of World War One and the unrest at Columbia University, he goes to work as an intelligence agent for the Soviets, and Cy Ogans was killed on Stalin's personal orders. I spent about five years chasing those ghosts. And so I wanted to find, when I was done with that book, and it's always, you know, as you know, you have to find the next book to finish the one you're doing. At least that's the way I find. And I was looking uh, to do a, another biography, but I didn't want to chase ghosts. I wanted to write about a living person. And I thought about Mayor Bloomberg. I thought about a guy that um, some people in the Bay Area still may remember, Steve Jobs, who I had known a little bit about tangentially growing up um, uh, on the Stanford campus. Steve Jobs was sort of a character in Palo Alto then. Um, and I wanted to find someone who was alive. And uh, I also wanted to write about New York history. I wanted to write about this crazy city, um, how a million miracles happen every day and somehow we get through the day. And I wanted to dig into exactly this history, uh, the 1950s and 60s and 70s of New York. Uh, the 80s I had known, I lived there in the 90s. I wanted to look um, at the making of the city and how it remakes itself. I didn't know anything about, as you said, I knew vaguely about the Secretary of the Treasury. I certainly didn't know about Lazarus Morgenthau. And I, I knew very little about the ambassador uh, to, to Turkey and his legacy. And it was when I met the DA under the guise, more or less, of a magazine piece. I was writing, um, was writing more and more for the New York Times Magazine, mostly on Russia, but I was already turning to New York politics. And I went to go see him. And I mentioned that I had read his great-grandfather's um, diary. It's a Lebensgeschichte. It's not really a diary. Uh, he wrote it when he was, I think, 24 in 1842. You know, that's chutzpah. Um, and that's when the DA kind of looked at me and I realized, oh, I think I could ask him about doing a family biography. Not, uh, he was going to run again. He had a slogan, 90 and 09, uh, which I thought was a catchy slogan. Um, and of course, um, uh, I think that the idea of a family biography, although it wasn't authorized then or now, uh, I think that appealed to him. And then we spent uh, countless hours uh, together. And as you say, I was in the room the night that he retired. Close to midnight, he left um, on New Year's Eve. And I was also not in the room, of course, uh, when he passed away, uh, but a few weeks before. So you interviewed, you must have interviewed hundreds of people. Are, are you are you a persona grata in Morgenthau? Uh, I don't know apartments and country rooms. How did how did how did they respond to your inquiries? Um, and were there any inter particularly interesting conversations? That led it's a it's a it's a great it's a great question, and it's one that's sort of a moving target because now that the book is out, you know, two or three days, I'm hearing from many of those people I interviewed, and I'm hearing from many of those people whom I did not interview. 
you know, you spend 10 years on a book, you think you've done, you know, I don't know, 300, upwards of 300 interviews that I had interviewed everyone because everyone in New York, as you know, uh, has a Morgenthau story. Um, and I did uh, try to interview everyone I possibly could. Uh, I wasn't going to turn down a source. Um, early on, it was one of my very first interviews. I went to go see someone who was quite close to the boss, as they all called him, even President Obama, uh, when he nominated one of the boss's most famous protégés, Sonia Sotomayor, to the Supreme Court. President Obama introduced Morgenthau as the boss. Um, there's a Morgenthau army of uh, attorneys who are veterans of one of his offices, either the federal office under the Kennedys or his 35 years as DA. They're everywhere. They're invisible to most New Yorkers, but they're everywhere across New York and indeed across the entire country. Chicago, Boulder, in London, um, these are the Morgenthau, uh, uh, the cores who remain extremely loyal to him. As I began making the rounds, I asked a question, which was in, I think, every profile of the DA, that he was, uh, you know, he was patrician, he was aristocratic, he smoked cigars. There were all these caricatures, all these myths. And one of them was, he never argued in court. And he hated this. It's one of the things he told me, he couldn't stand that everyone always said, I never argue in court. The DA shouldn't prosecute his own cases. And then I can't say the rest of the sentence, because as a former uh, sailor, he had a very salty uh, vocabulary. At any rate, I asked one of uh, his chief acolytes, former acolytes, um, you know, what is this about the DA never arguing in court? I learned very quickly the power of Morgenthau. I learned very quickly power in New York. The closed circle, as it was described to me, in which everything gets back to Morgenthau. Wow. Within three days, within three days, FedEx, I got, uh, I have it right here, a very large court transcript of the case that he did argue in court. And it was against the chief judge of the state of New York uh, in 1982, I think, and he won. It was about changing uh, the, the way the judges are, are picked. And uh, it was a case that he was very proud of. But it illustrates exactly your question. The word got back. If I went to go see someone frequently, they would there would be a silence, either across the ether or across the phone. And then they would say, I checked you out. Well, how about next Tuesday? meaning somebody had asked Morgenthau, maybe not directly, maybe indirectly. Uh, and occasionally I would get, um, directly to your point, I would get an email or a phone call saying, you know, I heard you talk to so-and-so. Uh, how come you haven't talked to me yet? Uh, and as I said, I tried to talk to everyone. It sounds like our crowd was pulling you in. You were kind of, uh, you were watched, but you were in. Um, well, as you said, uh, you know, I spent 10 years in Russia reporting on, on the Kremlin and other nefarious places. So it, uh, I was very, uh, there were times, though, joking aside, where I did feel that not being surveilled or watched, but being vetted. And rightly so. Who wants a stranger rooting around in your history? Um, you know, who wants to go going back to your great grandfather, going back to your, your great great grandfather? Uh, I certainly good. wouldn't. In their family, just from your book, you know, the lists that uh, that Henry Jr. kept of the, the women he was considering dating, whether he could marry them. I mean, they definitely, there is a family tradition of of, uh, of, of a taxonomy of who might be uh, near your milieu. Uh, speaking of which, uh, you want to speak a little bit about uh, the relationship of Donald Trump, another real estate developer, uh, with... Uh, well, actually, of course, Robert Morgenthau wasn't a developer, but they had a they had a, 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 some kind of a relationship, mostly related maybe to campaigns. And there's also a Wolman Rink connection. Um, did you talk to Did you talk to Robert Morgenthau about that? And uh, did he have any thoughts on the president's on, on Trump as president? Yeah, it's a great question. He um, Trump and Morgenthau. Uh, is a complex relationship. It's one of the longest relationships that Trump um, really has, uh, certainly with any politician. And it, it, Morgenthau, as DA, is the second most powerful elected politician in New York City. So it was something long before Trump was even, well, he was running for president, arguably, since the 1980s, but long before uh, 2016. I asked the DA about Trump uh, time and again. And in fact, in that office, the DA's office, which is one of the largest offices in Manhattan, if not the largest. Uh, Donald called. He would call fairly often. And I was there once when I 
I heard Donald's voice on the speakerphone in the way that powerful women and men in New York use the speakerphone uh, as a tool of their power and making you complicit in the room. Uh, you don't dare open your mouth, especially if you're a biographer. Um, <laughs> Donald is the son, as we all now know, uh, of a uh, mid-level developer of low-rise tenements in Queens. He has the biggest chip on his shoulder of anyone who's ever come out of Queens. I would have a hard time arguing uh, against that. He saw Robert Morgenthau as the patrician beacon, as the establishment, the very embodiment of establishment of Manhattan power. And Donald did everything he possibly could, and I reported this very thoroughly, to gain access to that world. He saw, he adored the DA. They were not friends. They were not close buddies, but they did see each other in the way that powerful members of New York society see each other at benefits, at galas. They introduced each other, literally from the podium. They gave awards to one another. And yes, Morgenthau had two beloved charities. One was the Police Athletic League, known as PAL. He had chaired it since 1961 under the Kennedys. It was very dear to his heart. Uh, it provides, the Police Athletic League provides uh, summer and uh, sports and arts uh, for, for children in New York City. His other charity, which Ed Koch put him up to, uh, and he willingly embraced it, is the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust in Lower Manhattan. He helped fundraise for it. He helped build it. He helped sustain it. And he chaired it. Uh, when it fell on hard times, both of these demanded a tremendous amount of money. Donald was the one who, not the only one, but he wrote checks, both for PAL. Morgan thought put him on the board of the Police Athletic League. It gave Donald entree to the world that he could only dream of in the 1970s. Suddenly, he was with the real real estate barons. Suddenly, he was with uh, members of New York society and the New York um, uh, legal establishment. And of course, he was helping uh, a police athletic league, something that was something that was obviously in Donald's favor. Uh, for the Museum of Jewish Heritage, um, Trump, we now know it wasn't his money, but the Trump Foundation did give um, quite a bit of money. At one point, he gave $100,000, I was able to find out. And that, was be and that was because Jared, his son-in-law at the time, was previously on the board. And was supposed to give money and Morgenthau could never get him to give money. In fact, he had to kick him off the board. And then he called Donald and said, you know, what's with the kid? And Donald said, what's the problem, Bob, the DA? And he said, you know, uh, he's he's not paying up. He and promised $100,000 and never gave it. And, yeah. and so uh, the next day a check uh, and, the, and the next day a check arrived from the Trump Foundation. Now, what's really important is that the DA uh, didn't take a dive on any investigation. It wasn't that what we now know. Obviously, uh, Morgenthau's successor, Cy Vance, for three years pursued Donald Trump and ended up nowhere. Um, the current DA, Alvin Bragg, who's the successor to Morgenthau's successor, also um, tried an investigation, which he now says it remains open, but who knows? Um, Donald Trump may be the slippiest slipperiest uh, uh, man in New York history, if not U.S. history. Um, but Bob Morgenthau didn't take a dive on an investigation. But what he did do is he gave him entree. Um, and, and Morgenthau certainly enjoyed He I, I write about it in the book. He said, I like the guy. He's fun to hang out with. He went to Mar-a-Lago. Um, he, um, he, he saw Donald as kind of um, uh, a benign force. And that was blindness. Obviously, it was blindness. And did he call him when he was in the White House? He did to ask about the Armenians. He wanted Donald to do what only Joe Biden did, which was to name the, the mass murder of the Armenians a genocide. It took that long before the U.S. government recognized it as a genocide. He did do that, but others asked him, well, why don't you ask Donald about the Supreme Court? Because Trump adored him. When, when Morgan Dodd died, Trump tweeted about it uh, several more than once. And... Uh, friends and colleagues of Morgenthau said, you know, why don't you suggest a few names to the Supreme Court? And he said, I don't want to do that. And I write about this in the book because you don't know Donald. He'll say, Bob Morgenthau told me this person, whether it was true or not. And he was shocked, like many New Yorkers and many people who knew Trump uh, more closely, 
than Morgan Thau did how he said that he used the word, how radicalized he became in the White House. It was a blindness, uh, and he admitted it. And at the end of the book, without giving anything away, I asked him, what do you fear most, thinking he would say something about God or death? And he said, Trump. Goodness, goodness. Well, so we see dynastic families working for good, working in a compromised society, trying to improve it. And then we see the difference between one kind of dynastic family and another one. Thank you so much for opening this century for us in a new way. This is a phenomenal book. It's entertaining. It's historical. It's interesting. And uh, it, it just opened my eyes to so many avenues of culture in our society that I hadn't understood uh, had the Morgenthau stamp on them. So... Thank you so much, Lisa. It's a, it was a gallop and a great romp. Thank you so much. I hope our, our listeners enjoy it as well. And thanks to Book Passage, uh, first and foremost. It's a great place. Uh, if you haven't been there, it's a great place to go. And buy any book. Morgenthau is great, but buy any book. We need people to buy, we need people to buy books in this country. Thank you so much. Thanks for that plug. And I'm going to plug your book now because it is it is um, phenomenal. So much research went into this. And as um, was already said, it's a entertaining as well as informative. And it's one of those books, I hate to say this, the holidays are coming up. Um, but since they are, um, everybody should buy a book. Everybody should get a book. And this is one of those books that when people come in and they say, we're looking for something that's a good um, book for someone who likes history, this will be on our table for um, those of you who love to read about history. So um, we want to thank you so much. And um, we have copies of the book in our bookstore. You can come in, you can order them online, you can call us, we'll send it to you. And we so appreciate it. Um, I just want to thank both of you for being here. And we look forward to sometimes seeing you live in our store. So um, thank you. And thank you to all of you for joining us this evening. Take care. Stay great, safe. Great. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.